this. And then to send love and compassion to the families of the 4 million that we have lost. So we're just wishing everyone who is going through this, because we're sharing this experience as a planet, all the love and light that they can possibly have and need going forward and better and more positive outcomes. So those mm -hmm. are the wishes I have today for the materials, titanium white fluid acrylic paint. Um, this is a lot like craft paint, but with more pigment, you could use craft paint or you could just thin your white acrylic paint. I have a splatter brush. If you need to know more about splatter, I made a very short video about that that explains all the different ways you can splatter with different tools and different techniques and the troubleshooting you might run into. The colors for today's class are cadmium yellow medium, cadmium red medium. We're going to use just a smidgy smidge of quinacridone magenta or magenta for the galaxy, but if you didn't have this color, you would be okay. Phthalo blue, titanium white, burnt sienna, Mars black, and dioxazine purple. So those are the colors and basic materials for today. I've got a towel to wipe my brushes off on. I'm going to be using brushes for acrylic painting and specifically for heavy bodied paint. So those are things to think about when you're thinking about your tools because some brushes are for soft or smoother paint and some brushes are for heavy body paint. All right. Are you guys feeling ready to paint these beautiful giraffes? I think okay. so. If you need the traceable, have you gone to the website and downloaded it? Huh. <laughs> Remember, you can resize a traceable on your printer in the printout options under scale. That scale tune where it goes more options, that lets you size up or down and help fit to your paper or canvas. And then if you want to go way bigger, you got a tool called post mm. It's a very cool tool. So it's good to know your printer tools when you're using tools like traceables because it will really help you. The wet palette is back. Yes, it I is. I was not lazy today. <laughs> and I'm going to put out some phthalo paint, and let's call this step one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Step one is an uh, awesome and simple step. We're going to paint the entire background blue. Hmm. I'm going to be using my phthalo blue. Um, I do use phthalo blue green shade in professional paint, but regular phthalo blue is essentially the same. It's just uh, PB15 without the uh, bias of red or green, so it doesn't have the semicolon second number. That's what that's all about. Semicolon second number is the bias of the paint. On student paint, you never have to worry about those things. Hmm. They, don't, they don't go red shade or green shade. They go, it's blue. Would you like some blue? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? How, if you're new to this, <laughs> Is there some sort of trick where you can find the hidden bias of it? Um, in that when you go to mix it with a secondary color, if it doesn't mix the color you expect, it has a bias. Um, so like if you were to take blue and mix it with uh, yellow and it wasn't making a green, it might have a red bias in it. Mm, so swatching. Swatching is always a good way to do that. Um, there's a really cool little tool I have to demonstrate sometime with a hole in it and some warm and cool paint that you can look at a paint chip through and kind of get an idea. Hmm, that's, that's interesting. That's pretty fun. Um, and we have like blogs and things about it. There's a lot on the internet that will just tell you, oh, hey, like ultramarine blue green shade is a yellow bias. I mean, uh, all phthalo blue green shade is a yellow bias. Ultramarine is a red bias unless it specifies otherwise. It's just a hidden color in the paint. See how we got that? Sorry to be tongue tied there. Oh my goodness. Huh. Well, it's, to... you know, it's really interesting. You're, you know, so much about paint that you can just sort of say that kind of stuff offhandedly. It's, yeah. it's quite an interesting thing. It is a weird experience to be doing that. Now, this is all we've got to do for uh, step one. I'm going to put out some purple. And some quinacridone magenta. And then I'm also going to put out some white. And then I'm going to dry my surface and we'll come back and do step two. But we'll go over the colors again just real quick. So this is going to be for the background. We've got phthalo blue, the oxazine purple, quinacridone magenta, titanium white. Dry your surface thoroughly and you want it to be dry completely and cool to the touch for the traceable step. And we have a video on how to use a traceable. If you've never done it before, I'm going to be demonstrating a product called Serral Paper today. Next step. Next step. Next step. We'll do. 
We'll put the step up as soon as you're done there. Okay. So, thank you guys. I've just heard all the little star chimes and the super chat and bells and all the stuff. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. And for all the emoji people out there, thank you. I love it. I'm, I'm, I, it's sometimes hard for me to type fast enough, but the emojis are a good way that we can sort of, you know, talk between the lines. So anyway, thank you guys um, for being part of our community, hanging out with us, doing all this kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> it's good to see you guys out here. Um, just reading some of the, the comments. If you haven't had a chance to join us in a live, I encourage you to try it. Um, it's a really great community of people out here. Hello, you. Hello. You would I'm like to have a step? From drying my canvas. Are you back from drying your canvas? You know what we forgot to do? No. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Let it out. Take another deep breath. Let out our stress, right? Try to pay attention if we're bringing any of our worries in from our real life, our regular life, to our art studio, to our creative time. I know I am sometimes. I got to take a deep breath. Let out my anxiety or my frustration. Or just the busy list of things to do, right? Just even those busy lists of things to do can be so much for our brains and bodies to process. And painting is a great way to manage that, but you got to take. A deep breath. So if you get a chance to do that, also try to pay attention to your shoulders and your neck and your back and make sure that you are relaxed and you're not holding a lot of tension. That can help prevent any injuries when you're painting. Important stuff. Now for the next step, I'm going to be using the Serral paper. Serral paper is a uh, color transfer paper to allow you to take a line drawing and transfer it onto your canvas. Um, we provide the line drawings for you. You can use one of the other methods shown in the traceable, like in the traceable descriptions in the mini books or in the video, but I really like this for acrylic painting. Carbon paper doesn't always transfer well. Martha Stewart has a white one that works pretty well, um, but I found its availability was sporadic. I put the bright yellow side down. That's the side that will transfer. You can see that I've used this several times. You can reuse these. I printed out my drafts. Um, I printed them on the setting uh, fill, the, the scale to fit setting. And I'm going to tape these down on two. Whoop, I got to position them and tape them down on two sides. So I want to make sure I line them up. A little tape to my serial paper. This is why I use low tack tape and not crazy tack tape. I'm not using gorilla tape. <laughs> no, we're not. Now that it's not a fantastic product, it is. So when you have this down, what you're going to be doing is everywhere I have a black line, you're going to be using that to transfer the image onto your surface. Right? I also like to trim my um, traceables down a little bit so that they don't go over the size of my 8x8 canvases. That just keeps them a little steadier and firmer. I'm going to press hard and go kind of over my lines. Sometimes I do a back and forth motion to make sure I've got a good transfer on an older piece of uh, carbon paper or sterile paper. And again, I'm only worried about the black lines. Mm. So tracing or transferring is a method uh, that was developed in the Renaissance called cartooning. And it allowed artists to work out a sketch on tiny little sheets of paper that they glued together, that glued uh, affixed together. And then they could use those cartoons and chalk and these little dotted holes to take a very complicated rendering and transfer it on expensive surfaces or variety of surfaces repeatedly. So a lot of times people will be like, tracing is real artists don't trace. And, and then I have to say, well, I guess Michelangelo is not a real artist. Hmm. Or they didn't cover that in art school. <laughs> you know, have to wonder what artist anxiety he struggled with. He didn't want anyone to know he used cartoons because people are apparently the same kind of mm's You know, I said that. this day to this day. I, I say, you got to wonder. And you know what? There's these, I just like, as I, words came out of my mouth, I was like, what about all those scholars that have gone and devoted, you know, 
eight years of their life to the study, study around this. So yeah. they, some, some people know this. I just don't know it. That's right. But it's knowable. It is. It's knowable. And you can know it too because there's this wonderful thing called Google and you can look things up now. Well, I was going to suggest museums. Well, if, you can go to, if it's safe in your area to go to a museum, I do suggest a museum. Absolutely. First source um, material. Sometimes museums are offering uh, virtual tours now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And you can see people's published papers on the Internet in a way that you never could before. So you could read somebody's master thesis often that's published out there in the world. It's amazing the information you have access to. Um, even if I, you're home and you can't get anywhere, you can go everywhere on the I Internet. I know this days. is going to sound incredibly old. Books are cheap on Amazon. Yeah, books have gotten cheap. <laughs> so, you, if you're I try really... not to think about it too much, but books have gotten real cheap. And it's what not a good sign for the books, is it? Well, having an original source of information is very useful, like a primary source, something that came from someone who was an expert who spoke about it, as opposed to somebody who read something and are trying to give you a five-minute synopsis of a very complex subject that they really don't know anything about to begin with. Wow, you can see John has a bias there. So, um, <gasps> Did I show my bias? My I wonder what color bias. it is. <laughs> Ooh, that's interesting. What color is your bias? Actually, these days I don't want to even ask people. I'm blue, ba -da -bee -da -ba 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 -ba. but <laughs> I don't know all the b da ba da boodoos. Yeah, you got to. Yeah, people will be like, purple is better than orange, and it'll be on. It'll be on. All colors that's how the are world is now. equal. I have seen people in, in some ridiculous fights over nothing. <laughs> I've come by and I've been that internet person who was like, I just want to point out that you're fighting over nothing. Mm hmm. This isn't a thing to fight over. Unfollow each other. Goodness gracious. Unfollow. Jane says, you look super cute today. Thank you so Mini much. Mini Sherpa is so cute. So this is a uh, watercolor pencil, and I choose that because it'll vanish into my paint. It won't stay in my paint. And I'm just making sure that in the step-by-step -step photograph, the lines of the giraffes are easy for you guys to see. So when you're, if you, when the mini books come out about seven to 10 days after the live streams, a little bit slower around our art retreats because we have an art retreat coming up. And, um, but you want to look for those. That's about when you check for them. And I just like to make sure that your step pictures look pretty good. So this is a step. We're ready to go to the next step. Is that a step? It's a step. It's a, you sure are stepping? Mm -hmm. it's a All step. right, stepped away. Uh, yum, yum, yum. Yum, yum, yum. I have to talk to you while John is not there, so I'm going to tell you what I'm drinking. I am drinking Yogo Vera, and it has aloe vera in here, and it's from Korea, and it's mango flavored. I'm not paid by these companies. I'm just letting you know what I'm guzzling. This is a thing to talk about. My daughter got me hooked on these, and they're non-carbonated, which I really like, and I actually do like the aloe vera chunks, but I definitely think that that could be a sensory problem for some people because it's they're slickery. You know, they're slickery. We're programmatically just ready to go to a commercial break. We and are. Here's the drink that I'm having today. I don't know. I just feel like maybe somebody's interested in the drink that I'm having. I know. If, well, they, they, if I, they are, I don't want to not tell them the drink that I'm having. I think it's just. I want to not tell you and then have you it's, wondering. It's a secret drink. It's not that secret. <laughs> So I've got a hog bristle brush in the size of a six. It's fairly tidy. I wouldn't want to do this. This is a little bit fluffy, right? So I would want one that stays tidy even when wet. Um, I've got a number eight cat's tongue. You can find these on Michael's website online or, at, or online at different art stores like the Tissot or Jerry's Arama. You can also uh, find them at the Brush Guys. And I'm going to be using a number 12 Princeton Round blender love this brush let's start with this if we need these other two we've got them here let's start with the round blender and another i've dropped three towels now off my i'm going to take my round blender not as wet as that my round blender damp and i'm going to get a little bit of my blue onto the brush 
and I'm going to start making my galaxy background. What I like about the round blenders is that they give me a very soft diffused effect. So if I want to create, you know, distant galactic cloud shapes, it's not such a hard thing for me. I'm going to come into my purple and I'm going to use my purple kind of instead of my black here. And I'm just making little kind of soft upward curls. Whatever brush you use, you want to just make sure that you're blending it in a sort of soft way. I can come here and grab a little of my magenta and purple together and some white. Break up that purple with some interest. Your galaxies are your own. Have some fun with it. Galaxy colors do tend to be phthalo, blue, magenta, and dot purple. If you've been subjected to any of the uh, five minute craft video, you'll, you'll catch that trend in there in the theming. And even though the tip might not work, the color theory is correct, is what I would say. Press the color theory there. When I mix my dark purple with my phthalo blue, I get almost an indigo. I like to rinse out periodically. All right, let me come here and say, say around my giraffes, things might be a little bit darker with purple. And again, Doc's purple makes a good alternative to um, black. Did you say with that hog bristle brush? This, this, okay, so here's the problem. This is a number six round hog bristle, but you can't get the brush. Oh. Which is why I haven't been talking about the brand. You're going to get some new ones. I am looking for a good replacement. I tested these. These are a lovely hog brush, but they tend to flare out. So they're great. They just don't give me the tidy work that this one does. Mm. So you're looking for a brush that tends to be tidy. I think it'd be easier to use a number four round there. And I'll do as much as I can with my round blender because these are easy to get. You can get you a round blender a lot. You can get Joann's and a bunch of places, Michael's. And I'm not sure if Hobby Lobby carries Princeton, but I think a lot of the art and craft stores do. I would say the biggest problem with the brush is that the, the varnish on it isn't particularly spectacular, but the price of the brush isn't overwhelming. So... What do you expect? Do we have AC on my dove? Mm -hmm. okay, we just good. don't have the big fan blowing in here, which is why it's quieter. Oh, yeah. That's right. The noise versus my staying alive. I can get the. No, fan. no, no. <laughs> it's okay. It's we just, just don't have the big on fan blowing. When you're like, oh, I'm going to be sweltering hot because the fan that would cool me makes too much noise. Hashtag YouTube life. Hashtag online art teacher. Hashtag my daughter will tease me for saying hashtag. My kids have pointed out to me, my oldest child and uh, my two littles have pointed out to me that um, we don't hashtag anymore. I love that fun moment where your kid informs you that something you do is no longer cool and you just think, I haven't done anything cool since I was like 25. No, no, baby, it's okay. I don't want there to be background noise in the video. So you see me here coming and taking a little bit of blue and blending that into to the purple, right? It's pretty lovely to create galaxies. What you don't want to do and what I do see a lot of you guys do is this. Don't do this. See this here? This is a tough technique to control to get your galaxy in. You want to have a little more a little more control into your galaxy. You can do the twirl a little bit, but you don't want the twirl to get away from you. Mm -hmm. Don't let your twirls get away from you. The nice thing about phthalo blue is that it's very transparent. 
So even when your paint is dry, you can kind of get a blend effect um, with the pure blue. So create a nice ombre where it feels wet into wet, even though that purple edge was long dry. More blue here. Pull that in. See, we're just making it feel very spacey. Spacey, right? How spacey is your space? I have a lot of videos on space. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. One of my favorite ways to make space is the sponge. Sponge makes a great space. Here's the saran wrap method of making space. There are ways to do this. So if you find ever that you're having trouble with a technique, that it isn't speaking to you, then just locate one that does. So I'm continuing just to put this next layer of blue out here. I'm happy to say I didn't need any of my tidier tools. If any of you are on TikTok, Please go follow my TikTok account because when I get to a thousand followers, I can go live. And I post, I post there. We need more TikTokers to join us so that we can. The TikTok, TikTok is TikTok. ticking. The talk is ticking. I know that you're probably like, man, but my app is so cool. And if you get on my app, yeah. it's going to make it lame. But go ahead and come and follow us because like, the minute we hit a thousand, we're going to do a live on TikTok and we're going to teach a lesson live yes. yeah right there on that platform and you know that platform could use it right mm -hmm. needs a little live art class so as soon as it enables what it's i'm assuming that what it says in the article is correct though, because what the article said was that if you had um a thousand followers on tiktok you could go live and all that stuff. well that's my jam making short videos obviously is not my jam but teaching art live is my jam. Mm -hmm. I'm taking just, see how this is just the toe of this brush. I come in, I get a little purple, I get a little my magenta, there's a smidge of white on it. And I'm just on the toe and it creates those beautiful little delicate galaxy spaces. Let's make these a little more noticeable for your naked eye. Isn't that lovely? And because the brush is soft, I can rock it and get to a blending edge and soften any of those lines that I want to soften. And you can do the circle, you just have to be careful how you see how that kind of made like a spot. That's why I avoid the circle. Is it's the it's the spot you have to avoid. Like the noid. <laughs> like the noid? Did you just noid us? I may have demonstrated my awareness of 90s pop culture. Later today on TikTok, I'm going to post a kitten and a baby chick that I painted this morning. I swear. It was I, a request. I researched Probably it. none of you guys are on TikTok. It's a platform. You're probably not there. But if you are. The platforms. The platforms. I like to back myself up. Here's my deal. Why do I care about all these platforms? Because platforms act crazy and I don't trust them and you never know how they're going to change rules or do something different. And I like to have backup plans for backup plans. Jenna has a good question. Ooh, Hi, Jenna. I got to swap out. I'll say it. I We're just continuing questions. making um, these little kind of curved strokes. of. When space. using the, the blender brush. Yes. Is it always soft pressure? You know, for the most part, I have to say it's it's very rare that I add any depth to the pressure of this brush. Um, I've had a couple of times where I have done a, a glazed kind of blushing where I really kind of got into it in a medium firm, never heavy, but I have gotten it into a medium firm when trying to do um, a blushing into a canvas. But on these light little elements, I keep it medium to light, to very light. Seems to be the range that I like to work it in. We're just going around and we're just adding 
little bits. This is the thing to practice right here is creating and learning to see your little cloud shapes. It is absolutely learnable. Even if today it's hard, it's learnable. Don't give up. Just do mm. the work, do the process. You know, if you're frustrated with your galaxy today, know that there's a future galaxy in you you're going to love. As long as you don't give up. Never give up. Never surrender. By Graptar's hammer. You shall be avenged. <laughs> Ah, uh, Tim. <sighs> this is one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Let's just bring a little more blue back here and make sure that that feels, you know, kind of got some depth. And you can always bring a little bit of lightness. Sometimes what you see me doing is kind of working the pigment into the bristles. So that I can get a better result out of it. Mm. And I don't feel like I've needed to get out any other tool. Right? I don't feel like I've needed to get out any other tools. So on the mini book, we're going to just put the number 12 Princeton blender for this step. Because I haven't had a need for any other tool. Right? The other tool I would have leaned into if I didn't have this on hand would be this tool, and I'll show you it just real quick, and then I'll show you the other one real quick, just in case you have any of those. I would get this damp. I would load up whatever color I wanted to, to do, and I would be making, see, it's a very similar stroke. See, I'm doing that. Let me see if I can get it. It's just a little harder to get that soft blend is what it is. And it's a little harder to control the moisture. But that's how I would get it with that brush. And if all I had was my cat's tongue, I would come in and work the edge of the cat's tongue. See what I'm doing? Sometimes with that, I get a little more of a kind of curve on the stroke, and it's a little bit more work to get, but you can get there. So that way, if you picked one of those up because that's what you had, that's how I would get there is, you know, just trying to keep the edge of my brush to the toe of my brush. And I can always kind of come in with a darker color. Harder. Hmm. But doable. Harder but doable. But don't feel stuck. Do it with a round, too. Could do it with a filbert. Could do it with a bright on the corner. Things to do. This is a step. Let's dry this. Gotta make it quiet so it's not so loud. Thank you guys for being part of the community, for hanging out. Um, I just saw some questions pop up here. I will read this. Uh, what? <laughs> what does cinnamon do to practice? Um, she she do, she'll do a lot of, like um studies. She she does a lot of painting. They were asking what you do to practice, and I was like, you do studies, and I see you work on your iPad. Yeah, so I I do a lot of in the evenings. I doodle and I concept art on my iPad, or I look for stuff to paint on my iPad. Um, in the morning, sometimes I do like exercises uh, in my different media. Right now, I'm focusing on watercolor because I need to kind of tighten up in my watercolor. Um, giving this to John, and then we'll go over the pictures. I paint every single day, sometimes uh, three times a day, four times a day. I have there are days where I have a multitude of paintings, like. I remember when I felt very daunted by the idea of just painting every day. And now I'm just like, man, there are some days I wish I could only paint once a day. <laughs> this is my second major painting today. Um, I, the watercolor I did earlier, I was going to just do a little thing. And then it turned into a substantive journey. I don't know what was going on with me, but I guess I decided to get into it deeper than I originally planned. 
Um, and I think that's because I'm still kind of re-loosening up on my techniques and trying to find my process through there. Uh, so I got a little bit more serious about it. I think um, the best way to grow your art is paint every day. There's another secret is that you actually just like to paint. Oh, I really do like to paint. <laughs> this is just like, I'm going to go paint. Like, okay. <laughs> I am not sad or unhappy that my job is painting. <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't make me bummed out at all. All right, on this one, we're going to do some stars. We're going to just do a simple splatter sky, okay? This is the basic galaxy sky. Now, if you don't have a splatter brush or tool to do this splatter, no worries, because uh, I have that other video, and it shows you the two brush whack method, the single dot method, like all the different methods. But this tool is actually an Art Sherpa Galactic splatter brush. It is not a toothbrush. Um, and you would never, ever want to put it on your teeth. And the reason I designed it is so that I could have this sort of, see how I loaded the fluid paint and I'm just doing a very gentle pull? I can almost have control, right, over where the spots go and how many there are and how heavy they are. That gives me a nice little light galactic Kind of thing and then the trick is here once you get that in take a detail brush i'll take a art sherpa number one round this is just a detail brush a good one but it is just a detail brush you just pick your smallest brush if you don't have a tiny brush you can use a toothpick it is a good idea in any galactic sky to make sure that you have some stars that are bigger, because <laughs> they are. They're big and small, They're close and far. Like, put them together sometimes. In this stage, you could actually add a constellation that's meaningful to somebody, like somebody's birth sign, um, you know, for their birthday, or a star that they were born under. All right, so this one I felt like got a little bit weird shape, but I'm going to let it go. I, and here I am not letting it go. I'm going to let it go, and then I don't let it go. So when it gets a little weird shape, I'll come back with a little bit of blue and be like, you will be rounder. Look at me. Sh round! I bossed that star all over the place, didn't I? Okay, so... This paint can take a minute to dry. You definitely want to hair dry it. We're going to hit it again. The reason I don't go to painting in the base of the giraffes immediately after the splatter is because if I drag my hand across any of it or rest my hand in an unopportune place, I'm going to go smear, and they're going to be comets and not stars. <laughs> hmm. So you got to make sure you don't have uh, too much wind. Otherwise, you have comets, and they go to get a little blown away. So make sure you try to use low air movement when you're drying them so they don't get too strickety. Um, yeah. Hi. And you just want to make sure they are thoroughly dry as she is doing because then you know you don't want the brush stroke to streak it either. So I think that's why she's making sure she gets it thoroughly dry. I'm, I'm just not sure what else to say other than make sure it's thoroughly dry. I'm for a, at a loss for drying words today. Are you? We well, could tell him that there's a meetup on Sunday I, next week. I could have told him that. <laughs> you can come meet me in person um, at the Shawnee and the Poconos on Sunday. The 25th, moderators correct my date if I'm wrong, <laughs> one to three. Hmm. Three. If you feel like painting with us, there's one little spot to paint with us for three days straight. This is three days straight. And then third, and step. Oh, you're going to step here? Step. All right. Whoosh. We're so serious. Serious about it, aren't we? Are you serious about it today? Breathing in deep. Breathing out, breathing in deep. 
Breathing out. You've got this. You can do this. All right. Now we have to paint in the giraffe. Um, I'm going to grab a number four round. And then I've got my cat's tongue. And that should be plenty easy for me to paint in my giraffes. I have on the palette Mars Black, Burn Sienna, Cad Yellow Medium, Cad Red, Still Quin Magenta, Docs Purple, and Thalo Blue. But right now I'm going to begin with a little bit of my Burn Sienna and Mars Black. And I'm going to come under the jaw here. And under the neck. And here, like under the little mouth. I'm just at the nose, little curve, bring that line back, add a little semicolon. Coming into the inside of the nostrils with like a little stroke, of kind of like a little letter C. Giraffe's eyes are so interesting. Because they're very large, but also at the same time in set. I have some dark to the inside of the ear. Dark to the inside of the ear. Right here, I'm going to add a little bit of dark. Coming under here, I'm going to add some more of this dark color. Coming under this neck as well. And I'm going to blend this back just a bit. I'm wiggling my brush back and forth to kind of push the paint back. In a diffused way you want to do this without like damaging the filaments of your brush so you want to be medium to light pressure on the surface not not overwhelming pressure mm -hmm. adding a little shadow on where the horns are because they have a little shadow on the horns A little bit behind those ears. I'm pushing a little bit there. Right. So we're just getting sort of this general relaxed area. Now for the giraffe main color, we're going to take a little brown and cad yellow together. A little more yellow than brown, and we're going to begin to add white into it. And that's going to be our basic kind of giraffe color. Just to start with, the gir these giraffes have many more colors than this. But They're just layered gotta, giraffes. Got to get a little bit of the giraffe color on because we've got a nice deep dark blue kind of coloring and. We're doing what's called blocking in. This is why cartoons or traceables are considered just compositional maps. Because at some point, there's nothing left of what you put down on the canvas. And you still got to find your own way through. It's why I will never just let it go when somebody's like, oh, they're, your students are cheating. I'm like, huh. let me take you back to that school. We're going to have a little minute here. Because the truth is, and uh, I've just done this for a while, so I can promise you it is, is that you will have to find your own way through. If I, don't, if I lose a little dark area, like I'm picking up some dark just to make sure I don't lose my eye in that spot mm -hmm. because I want to be able to see it. Brown, yellow, white. Initially, going to be more colors than this. And here I kind of flick this off in a... These are feathered kind of way on the toe of my brush here. Color around the ear. Come around the ear. You can see at this stage it's super streaky. It does not look neat. It does not look tidy. 
Yours shouldn't either. It, I have really good paint. Mm. You know, and it's still going to have this look about it. It's, um, it's just about the transparency of paint and the fact that we're just blocking in. Look around that nostril. Around the ear. This is just layer one. Little giraffe horns are so cool. Pops of their little horns. They're like almost like little frond fronds or doodle heads. Mm. There's just something so incredibly playful about them. I just love it. I'll go into my number eight cat's tongue, and here's why. You could use a round, you could use a filter. I just want a bigger brush so I can paint the rest of this just a little faster. I use the number four round where I feel like I need a little more control. And then I'll come back with the eight. Just make sure everything's okay. Come up this little giraffe. This is what we did on our first retreat, but we did it in on paper and watercolor paper, the watercolor background. It's a two-day project. Mm. It's sort of fun. And again, you can see that we're not losing our composition. We're not losing our values that we kind of mapped out. We're just making sure that there's paint in the right kind of general hue and color to address what we've got going on here. Sometimes you just need a layer or two. Little brown, little yellow, little white. Mm -hmm. I do think a little bit about the directionality I'm going to be going when I'm applying the fur, and I do think about, you know, certain little things. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't be like that, like all different angles. Yeah, and why is that? Because I think it would disrupt the visual line to the finished piece. Hmm. I do. I think it would disrupt it. How is everybody doing? Do we have any questions while we're painting in the very fiddly bits of drafts? Let me see here. What next time you're doing a commercial, they would like to know what hairband you're wearing. Um, I will put it in the link. I don't remember the name of the company that did it, but they're the only one that. Oh, this here. Yeah, I will. I don't remember the name <laughs> of the company. Um, but uh, just I just gotta make sure I know what I'm talking about. Um, but I will, I will go find it and, and put it in. So what I did is I bought this little floral. It was like under bridal flower crowns and on Amazon. And then I bought butterflies, baby clip butterflies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I made it. Now, this is a process question. Okay. So when you're painting and putting this painting together, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't paint the galaxy all the way across the entire sky behind them. You sort no. of did it around the cutout of them. Yeah. How come? I think it worked out really well because it felt like it. <laughs> that was just the way you approached it? That's just the way I approached it today. There wasn't a deep, overwhelming reason. It's just galaxy can be a lot of work, and they take up a large amount of the canvas. So by doing the whole galaxy, I'm going to lose, what, like half the galaxy. So if you just were... I was just like, I didn't want to put a lot of time into a galaxy I wasn't going to have at the end. Sometimes I do. Sometimes what's behind them, they're not going to cover up everything. It's minimal. And sometimes it's a galaxy. lot. And today was a lot. Mm. 
That is what happened. It was just a lot today. That happens. Well, and you've got to make those decisions when uh, when you guys start doing your own original stuff. Sometimes you'll have to decide if I paint all the galaxy first and the best part of my nebula is here, how's that going to feel? Hmm. Right. And it's, so if if your composition takes up a large amount or it has a contour like this was very easy to paint around. But let's say they had a contour that would be very difficult to paint around. Then I might do the whole thing behind them regardless. You really just have to make a decision about what layers it's going to take to do a thing. How will the layers work together? Why will they work together? There's never an always process. And you don't want to get caught into always process thinking. Because it will limit you and what you can do creatively. You want to have lots of strategies to get through painting, lots of techniques to work it out, and then decide in each individual project what suits your needs the most. I think I overpainted the eye too much. I think we have enough of it covered up where the rest of it will come in nicely. Yeah. So let's take a picture there, and then we'll come back, and we'll continue in painting in our giraffe. Okay. You can have it messy at this stage. I really want you guys to realize that just as long as your blacks are kind of worked out, and I haven't even put my mains in yet, you know, so you, you're okay at this stage for it to be a little streaky. I'll let you know when you've got to worry about anything different than that. Um, you know, it's easy to get caught up in an idea or process or rule in art. Like I will see people often um, be like, you have to always blank, blank, blank in art. And I'm like, there's some material science that you're pretty much stuck with. Like acrylic does not paint over oil. Oil can paint over acrylic, but acrylic doesn't paint over oil. That's just, you're just stuck there, you know. But for most stuff, if it's not a safety concern issue or a material fail issue, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. I'm not saying make an invisible sculpture and charge somebody $18,000 for that. I'm still reeling from that. And then there's an artist that's suing him because he did it first in 2016. And mm -hmm. I just think both of them should go to jail. I wouldn't admit that. I made an invisible sculpture first. No, I did it. Really? You both are going to brag about that? I'm like, okay. But this is what gets people upset at fine art. Like when there's a reasonable thing somebody did in fine art that's maybe weird and conceptual and then... And then people are like, I don't get it. Why is this in the museum? And then somebody's like, I'm in an invisible sculpture. Mm -hmm. <sighs> pay the monolith guy. I pay him 18. I don't have $18,000, but I pay the monolith guy $18,000. I'm going to come back with my black. Did you guys see that with the sculpture, the invisible sculpture? <laughs> I did. John did. Well, he heard me like, what? And he comes running in. What's going on? I'm like, art world making my life hard again. Just cleaning up some little lines there. So now I'm going to kind of go through and maybe work on the base of him um, and get him kind of uh, blocked in a little bit neater and tidier and a little more reflective of what he has going on. So I'm going to take my yellow and red now and now i'm going to get into some oranges right some bright colors add some brown into that like you do a little white and come in at the top of the lip so this is really pretty right here As I'm going to come around, I might add a little more white. And give that nostril a little bit of a highlight. Add a little more white into my mix. We're going to do the spots and patterns kind of last. 
We're not going to try to do them at once. I'm going to let some of this be maybe like a little bit of like there's hair here. This is a lighter color at the top. More yellow over the eye. Get into the orange. I'm going to be kind of winging through some different little values here. Okay. You wing away. Wing away. I'm going to go light under the eye. Light over the eye. Have a little bit darker. Get into this. So that's what this color is here is this is a little yellow, a little red, and a little brown. And some white into it over here. And that's how we're getting under the jaw. When you're painting a patterned animal, Sometimes a good strategy, not all the time, but sometimes a good strategy is to paint the value of the animal before you add the pattern into the mix. Grab a little bit of white and just make this kind of light right there. While this is still wet, and I may put some glazing medium out. I may put some glazing medium out so I can get a nice blend. How's everybody doing? Really good. I was just looking over here. I keep getting distracted by reading chat instead of um, watching what you're doing. So I was like. I'm just taking the glazing medium so it kind of blends here and is soft, integrated, because I don't want a harsh line, but I do want it to be there. Looking at my nostril, I may open it oh. up a bit. Irene was asking a good question. Mm, wonderful. At what point in the art journey should slash does an artist need to start making original works? When you're ready. Ooh, going to hold that mirror up. It's one of those dangerous answers, man. So what it is, is that um, original work, you know, and you need to understand what an original is. A lot of times people are really unclear when something is an original. They feel like they can go on Pinterest and repaint with minor changes, stuff they see there, and uh, call an original. There's another place right now, not in our licensing division, on YouTube, repainting a design I did years ago. I had to sit there and take a knee and decide what to do about that legally. And it's because artists, um, I've, I don't know what I'm going to do about it, but... That's a thing that you have to think about. It's You can't be like, oh, it's in watercolor now, so it's different. It's not. It's not different. You have to be ready to understand when is my work original, when is it different. You've got to understand some stuff about, you know, that when you're going out there. Um, but for the purposes of, you know, you creating work that's from your imagination, you know, anytime you want to do that, Anytime, you're never going to be harmed by working your imagination. You know, and you're never going to be harmed by working your imagination. And if you still want to have references and ideas to help you through, but without tutorials, use sites like Paint My Photo, Upsplash, and Pixabay, or a licensing image site where you pay the artists and photographers for their design. Pay them. Pay them. Pay them. Pay them. <sighs> and then it's not a thing. And then, you know, when you're trying to figure out, I'm adding highlights to the places where I see the brightest parts of the little giraffe's head here. And I'm just tapping my brush up and down to get a nice little blend. Um, your original voice is all the techniques and skills you have in combination with your life story. 
when you go to the canvas and you're telling your truth authentically from your soul, you're working it. And you can do that at any point in your art journey. That can be something that can happen to you right away and, and uh, later. It's just when you're ready for it. Because right now what you're doing is you're building up your skills, you know? And also, you know how some people like to just play piano, but they don't want to write music? Where's the room for that? Have you seen that? Like people just want to play piano. They're not here to write music or compose originals or do any of that. Nobody gets all up in the piano people's grill about when are you going to write your own music. That's true. They're just perfectly happy to show up and sing by the piano. And I feel like tutorials can be like that. They're like music that's composed that you might play from your piano. Add a little bit of my brown here. So there's got to be room for that. It's, all, it's, it's also like, all right, so you're doing originals. Do you have to sell them? No. You don't have to anything. You, I, I, I do think it's good to be thoughtful when hunting on Pinterest for stuff to do because it's not just tutorial artists like myself or the many tutorial artists on YouTube. It's, it's working artists that post their stuff there for their businesses and careers. Not to be the unpaid designers of the world. <laughs> but here's the exception to that rule. Would you guys like to know the exception to the Pinterest rule? Hmm. When you're trying to learn something in the privacy of your own home and you look at a painting and you create it for yourself to deconstruct the techniques and ideas, they ask you to do that in art school. You go to the museums and you look at the paintings and you sit down and you paint what you see to help you understand how that stuff is built. That's okay. Just don't be sticking it online going, my original blankety blank, because hmm. it's not. But also, with all that being in mind, now that we've opened up that weird, John asked me that question a weird time. I did. <laughs> he did. He, he, know, he knows I've been like, ugh, lately about it. Um, this is good. You know, uh, so there's never like, even in this, is there? There's never like a holy yes or a holy no. I was just helping my friend Angela Anderson deal with some copyright theft where somebody had put her stuff on some online website and how to get that taken down. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's just working artists have to think about those things. But you painting something in the comfort of your own home, I'm going to continue to add a little highlight here. I'm grabbing some white and I'm just continuing to add not a pink highlight, but a little highlight here. You know, you doing something um, in the comfort of your own home, I think is a normal student thing to do. Yes. And should be allowed, and nobody should be able to say boo to you about it. Wow, weird mood today. <laughs> I'm just adding a little bit of orange. I'm doing the thing that makes the mini books hard. <laughs> What's that? Doing like lots of the same thing for a very long period of time. Well, you just have to keep, there's just many layers <laughs> of the same thing. Many layers of the same things, my friend. And to help you with your many layers of the same thing, reference photos. Thank you for Kelly for reminding me. Thank you for reminding. What did we forget? To keep the reference up. I had to show the reference photo. Sometimes you got to do that. So we've got our color here, our yellow and our red and a little brown. Maybe a little more yellow in it. You can just see I'm just working through them giraffe colors. Lots of little micro mixes on this one. That's why I rated it a higher uh, skill level. When you've got to do lots of little fussy mixing, hmm. I, I raise the, the hoot level on it. You have to wonder, why isn't there a yellow called giraffe? 
There probably is, to Crayon, be real probably. honest. If it, if it isn't in Deco or Americana Paint or Plaid or somebody, I would be super surprised. Deco is very, like, we're going to call it giraffe. You know, or or plot or any of them. They're very. They think kind of like a makeup line, huh? <laughs> so about paint colors, which makes it fun, but a little tough if you're following along in a tutorial and you're trying to figure out like, well, what am I supposed to be doing? I'm gonna flick this stroke back to create some little fuzzies in the ear. I might come in here to my white. I come back like a, a like a little quarter of an inch to sort of imply that there's a lip of that ear. A little bit there and again we haven't really gotten into um, I'm gonna bring a little of my red and yellow and brown down here maybe put a little bit of that color behind there and down the cheeks Get into our giraffiness. Giraffness. Add some blending medium if it's giving you any grief. Blending medium if it's giving you any grief. Today is just one of those painting days where you just kind of work your little colors. A lot of the good day to practice your blending. It's a good day to practice your mixes. It's just a good day. Now it seems these brush strokes are, are developing a lot of the um, shape and implying a lot of like the roundness that you're getting. I think so. I they do definitely contribute into that. Coming down here, I can go. Oh, there's a little more orange at the neck. There's a little more orange at the neck. And kind of blend in the brown. Blending in that brown. You can see how the second layer pulls it all together. How are you guys doing? Good, I think. So when you're looking at the ratings on our lessons and you're like, do I want a one hoot or two hoot or three hoot? How do you hoot? How do you hoot? Um, three hoots, you want to have some basic core skill sets down. It, you can always paint above your hoot level. <laughs> We're never going to be like, no, stay in your owl, man. <laughs> paint above any level you want. But the reason I rate them is so you understand, oh, I might need more materials, I might need more brushes, or I might need more skill. Right? Um, so one hoots are like, I have not painted since grade school, and I'm not really sure what complementary colors are, primaries, or any of it, and it all seems kind of new and crazy, and I just want some help. That would be there. Mm -hmm. um, at two hoots are like, you've kind of been painting long and you, you understand there's dry brushing and blending wet into wet and some basic, basic fundamental color mixes. You know, that's where you're looking at there. Sometimes I'll get really into a much lighter giraffe color, as you can see. And again, we haven't even done the patterning yet. We're just getting the blue knocked back. Now, right now, are you painting the under spots? N uh, no. No, no spotting has shading. been done. I'm just doing, if the giraffe had no spots, I'm just kind of painting its base giraffe color with no spots. Mm -hmm. None. None. No, none of the giraffe spots. Every time you say giraffe color, I just get tickled thinking about walking into an automotive dealership and saying, I'd like a giraffe colored one. 
I bet it's been done. I'm going to start adding some of the um, orange to the mains. And I might add some orange to his mane too up top just because I want to build that up and definitely create even like the little edging where perhaps it's uh, a little lighter. So short brush stroke. back into the base giraffe color and let's call this a step because we did a lot here yeah and you guys might need a second to find your way we're going to be doing the same thing that we did here over here you want to give it a quick dry or are we good i'm okay. going to give him a quick dry so i don't drag my hand through all this paint all right now while we're doing that i will say thank you guys for joining us and i have a special thank you hold on i'm gonna make mini mini stripper go away and then say for wah! For text message notifications, send all one word, the Art Sherpa, and the phone number you send it to is 33222. That gets you signed up for our text messaging system. That way you can know when we go live. Something like that, right? Yes. Here's a step. Step. So we're getting closer to looking more giraffey in the stars. It's just a build up. With acrylic painting, you're building up layers, you're building up structure, um, you're, you, you're definitely finding values, there's, there's a process through which you get there. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Sometimes you do them in like thick coats and applications, sometimes you do them in glazes, sometimes you do that in wet and wet or blending. It's, there isn't really a right or wrong, there's just the way you're going through the painting today. So things to pay attention to is where there are lighter areas in the giraffe's face and lighter areas at the neck, where the shadows might be, uh, you know, trying to do that. I will try to come up with a one hoot giraffe lesson. Is the giraffes were so popular, I feel like I'm going to come up with a one hoot giraffe too. Mm. So that if you're very, very new to painting, you have a giraffe. Actually, wait, I do. I did a one hoot giraffe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Baby giraffe. It's the baby giraffe was born. I did that. I did one in crayons too. So I paint giraffes on occasion. There's, I, I, been, there's been so many paintings. Sometimes I'm like, what? Same thing we were doing on the way uh, down. Like down, we're going to come on the way back up. Get some little wine in there and just start up painting. And this little beigey beige. <gasps> now I'm going to be putting a shadow under the head for sure. Sometimes though it's just nice to begin the process. Mm. I always come here and be like, hey, and just a little bit deeper in the fur. So the mix again is pad red, pad yellow, burnt sienna, titanium white. All of the little colors that we're finding here come from those mixes. I'm just on a number four round. Sometimes I get a little bit of glaze and I'll come in and just make sure that, you know, my neck is shaded the right way. Put yourself through the paces. Mm. To get the under giraffe in. 
Get the under giraffe in. Which this is, is the under giraffe. Which Not is the a, underminer, he's the under giraffe. And this is a very important <laughs> distinction to not stand under a giraffe. For that any would reason. not go well. For any reason. No. Add that little inside color to the ears and get more into my yellow and white. Add a little fluff in there. The fluff is nice. Fluffness. The fluffness is always nice. A little white. So I've got my uh, yellow with a bit of cad red in it and some white. Just created a light ear over here. Sue is asking, can you tell us about your background in painting? Um, I grew up third generation artist so I always had art in my life I always had art supplies always had everything my mom it was a working artist and my grandmother was an accomplished painter and I actually we had photographers on my dad's side of the family so creativity was a supported activity um so I got to paint my whole life and because of my mom I got to get some art school in um she helped make sure I got to go and then uh, I did a lot of time working in the licensing market, which was an interesting thing. Worked in galleries and art studios. Like my jobs have always been like art related. They have been in the art space. Because, and I'll tell you why, I am the worst cocktail waitress on planet Earth. Hmm. Not, not like me, not bad at, not cranky, just that at the skill set required for bringing cocktails to a table. Yes, I understand this. So I had to, I had to work in those jobs <laughs> because that <laughs> I was qualified to do. I got to go to Prairie View A&M mm -hmm. and uh, study with a man named uh, Professor Tally. Reverend. Re that's right, Reverend, Reverend Tally. Clarence. I forgot the I, Reverend. I only say this because I had the joy of speaking to him last night. That's right. We called him. You called him. So it was a definite different um, experience. I got to do some art institute, but I would say that most of what impacted me as an artist was probably my time at Prairie View um, and the instructors and teachers there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no. The things that they said and did. <laughs> I have to say, it was super, super nice to be able to talk to. Um, Reverend Talley, because I was able to express how grateful I was. He's probably the most influential teachers I've ever had. Yeah, I think for me too. Just uh, left a mark. Left a mark. And a good one. <laughs> Not one that we got to come <laughs> revisit later. <in> <laughs> ah, no, wait, it, just an excellent role model and a really fun human being and a terrific artist. and Fantastic artist. I really artist. like his work. You can you can look him up, uh, Reverend Clarence Halley, and you can see his art. Because hmm. he, he out there doing it. It's actually ClarenceTalley.com. I was out there just checking him out. Oh, is does he have a website now? He does. Oh, good for him. I share his link. in the in art the, biz now. I'm gonna share it. Share it. I'm you can share it. it. You can go check it out. Um. Yeah, no, he just definitely, <laughs> definitely was impactful. Did uh, a bit of work at Glacel. It was really helpful. My mom also, when I was a girl, took me to every single lecture she could at the Watercolor Society. So I got to study with amazing artists, even at a young age. Um, I was very lucky there because my mom saw value in that and saw value in me going. Mm -hmm. I definitely think if you have a kid who's interested in art, you can place value in what they're doing with things like that. Like if you're like, man, I don't, I don't know what to do. Look at the Watercolor Society. They are amazing. They are incredible. 
even if you're not a watercolorist, they are a profound art organization that does so much to help educate and elevate its members. So, you know, stuff to do, stuff to do. Been doing this on YouTube for this, a shocking number of years. Let's not go into how many years. Hmm. <laughs> let's, let's not worry about how many years. Let's just say I'm very qualified now to teach online. Can I come up here? We're highlighting the front of the face. But I think, I'm going to tell you something, I think, honestly, I think the art world is changing. I think that the space of self-educated artists is, is incredibly powerful. And in I have seen people, because you can decide what is of value to you, right? I think the only weakness for artists that are self-educated is maybe not knowing that they need to do more material safety and studio safety. Yes. I think that's it. But I think the teachers out here are amazing. I think you can get exposed to all kinds of things and thoughts and ideas that will help you grow. Um, I think it's just all a different world than it used to be. Coming through there. Now I'm going to start to work his little eyes. Because mm -hmm. you got to work the little eyes. And a little shout out to under the eye. I like that. Yeah. And then getting into that orange is really wonderful. I think also, whereas my mom did not give me art lessons, mm -hmm. you might think she did, but she very rarely did. Um, I think she was very smart and she realized that the job of being a parent um, kind of <laughs> completely <laughs> implodes the job of being an art teacher. <laughs> but she made sure I always had art supplies and she made sure I always had art education and that I had answers and I was exposed to museums and um, Lots of different thinking. She didn't let me get into a thinking like, well, abstract is dumb or this is good and this is bad. She she uh, made sure that I had a chance to examine my world better. I'm going to add a little more orange there. I'm just trying to, you know, make sure that the color in the face is like this base color before I ever put the patterns in is just lovely. Let's get a little more orange in here. Maybe a little further into the red. Kind of come up even over the horns, right? Okay, let's call that a step because that was a lot to take in. Is, That's yeah. a lot to do. Let's take a look at where you're trying to get. You're trying to get highlights. You're trying to get, oh, I gotta actually, before I even get the step there, I'm going to add this because I got it on the other, other one and I didn't get it on him. Hmm. I'll just get it when I come back or you can blend with your finger. Um, if you're just trying to get highlights. You're trying to get shadows, develop form, develop shape. Start creating detailing out that starts to make the animal make sense and take up space in your canvas. When we come back, we'll continue on adding details and elements that bring the piece together. Take a deep breath in, breathe in your creativity, breathe out your worry. 
Breathe in your creativity. Breathe out your worry. You are not having to be stressed. You're only coloring. Just coloring. Coloring is good. We know that in our souls, right? We know that coloring is good. We know that coloring is good. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to take a little bit of my black on my number four round. And come in my eye. And make sure that inside there, very black, I'm going to also come here and make sure that on my nostril, I'm going to run that, I've got a nice line there. I'm going to get into my brown, maybe a little bit of black, but mostly my brown. I'm under here. Talk about that lid. We won't really see the lid until we add the reflection. Right. Come here to the front of the eye. There's a, there's a darkness in the front of the eye. Not like a darkness like he's, he's like brooding, but you know, <laughs> darkness to the front. He's not brooding. He's fine. He's okay. He just is uh, working some stuff out there. I'm going to grab a little bit of white. Come along my nostrils. Make sure that I'm highlighting some other outer edge. Maybe even here on his little face, above his eye. I'm going to grab some of my orange inside his nostril and make sure that I just a little bit so you can see the shading in there. Because he got shading. Mm -hmm. He do. Love the orange. I did turn my canvas. Sorry, guys. So just sometimes it helps me to see certain things. While we're here and letting that dry, I'm going to come into my mane. My mane is definitely my cad uh, red and some yellow, and there is a little bit of brown in it. Like to make sure that we've got nice little off the uh, ear antlers. Hmm. I'm flicking back to get that little the little mane. Flicking back to get the little mane. Now, this has some unusual qualities to it because it's a night scene, but it has like sort of like this, the, the light sources. No, the light sources are not accurate. This is definitely a fantasy light source. No, would this be like a semi-realism kind of thing? Uh, I would say this would be like magical realism. <laughs> like? Surrealism. You know, where little elements like you are painting an objective, you know, pair of giraffes I'm adding a little bit of a gold highlight to the top of that main a little white and yellow on that um you know they do they're gonna look like giraffes but they're certainly not there are no giraffes in front of this guy whoops you know but we're doing art so we don't have to do realism that's not what we have to do that's not our job. Mm, this is a complicated question. Okay, I will give it a, my best shot at an answer. Because the curiosity, the there's a lot of cats out here. They're very curious cats. Okay. Just out of curiosity, pure curiosity. If Cinema was doing this painting on her own, not as a tutorial, 
how long would it take her to do the whole thing, do you think? No. So that's a tricky thing. Um, yeah. It depends on, like, a lot. A little less time in that, but sometimes it's more time because I'll change my mind five or six times. Because in my own painting, if I don't like something about it, I don't mind painting it out and changing it at all. Like painting it completely gone and putting it back. But when I'm with students, I find that you guys find it super anxiety making if we paint a whole section of a painting and then just gesso it away. It's not playful or fun for you. <laughs> so we don't do it. Hmm. I'm going to add some uh, black. Um, most paintings don't take me an exceedingly long amount of time if they're not large. Um, just because, and if I'm not having to explain or teach or go through that process, I'm going to add a little bit of a shadow right here with my black and brown along the horn. I don't have to go through that process. It's, it's definitely easier on me. Mm. Um, just in the construction of the art, I absolutely love teaching you guys. Please don't get me wrong. I don't think they could. You do this almost every day. I don't think anyone could misconceive that you like to teach painting. It's all well, It's so weird. Sometimes I do get people who are like, you're just trying to be famous. It, this it, is the <laughs> hardest way to do that. It's the longest road to fame. In, oh, in, man. And like, fortune. There's, this is not a, this, there's, there's so many more profitable ways to be a YouTuber. Some lady was on TikTok going, I do now, we all know I'm not going to do copy editing because I can't spell. But she was like, I make $600,000 a year doing copy editing. And I'm like, I may have made career-wise bad life choices. <laughs> hmm. Just for, if you're just talking income. Now, of course, I don't believe her. I think that that was a fairy tale told to get people to sign up to her class. But, you know, and I'm very grateful that I get to do what I love for a living. And I get to teach and get people excited about art that has been a, a great blessing and a, and a great privilege but no i'm not doing this to like make a name for myself as an artist <laughs> uh, which is why i didn't do painting with cinnamon hmm. that makes not sense. <laughs> and also i used to really struggle having my name be cinnamon on the canvas i always felt like that's a weird thing that when I was doing fine art, it was like, that's a weird signature. That wasn't so bad for licensing, but uh, in the fine art space, I felt like that, that was just really weird. Now, this was, it was funny because uh, someone you know, out here asked uh, whether giraffes have horns or antlers. And I remembered this, but I couldn't remember what they were called. They're called ossicones. And they're, they're but, a kind of horn. When John's explaining ossicones, I'm going to take a detail brush and come along the eye, underneath the eye, between the black and the brown, and make a little highlight of white. Well, just the big thing is, is boys, both boys and girls get them. In this case, for sure. And they're just sort of like, they're kind of like horns. They're a little softer, a little frizzier, but, you know. This is what they are? This is what you get, an ossicone. An ossicone. With a little black and some white. And add a little flick of lashes to the front of the little eyes. Let's see, we got little giraffe eyes now. Mm. That's a step. We are there. Hold on. We've done a thing. Don't you feel good about doing a thing? I always feel good when I watch you do those things. There you go. We're on the next step. I take next a picture. Next step. Next step. So, again, pay attention to your neck and back. Breathe in deep. Breathe out. Don't forget to follow and comment and subscribe. I uh, got some messages about doing some horse painting, so I'm going to think about getting that into the schedule where I can. Um, I've got some great input. Don't forget, if you're on TikTok, to come over and follow me because we'll start streaming there. Um, because we like, we're like all the places <laughs> for safety so platforms can go as crazy as they want. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about it. <sighs> Deep breath. So, 
anywhere that it feels a little streaky or you don't like the coverage on the canvas, I'm going to take my number eight cat tongue and I'm going to get some of my light giraffe color. And just make sure that I've got good coverage. It can be dry brushed or blended when into wet. But I do want to make sure that I've got good coverage. Because it's easy to lose the coverage, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Faces are pretty good, but my neck's good. Have a little minute. Just going to blend that in. Now I have some other shading, but I'm going to do it in a different way than you might expect. And making sure we just have a nice blend on our giraffe's little neck, right? Making it sort of have that the shape of of the neck that you want. Yeah, we want a nice little neck shape. Be nicely shaped, Mister Neck. Mm -hmm. Nicely shaped. And nicely covered. And that's a great thing. So it's that touch up stage, and you just want to make sure things are touched up and look good. I'm going to take my number four round and I'm going to grab my red and yellow mm -hmm. and some brown. And we're going to begin to talk about spots. Just adding those. What makes this color a little different? You added some. So it's the cad red, the cad yellow, and a little burnt sienna. Cool. Adding some little spots. At this stage, and I might, where I, I can also bring some of it over to my brown and black over here, if I need to bring a couple of spots up that maybe are a little different. Take my light draft color and make sure that the highlights that I want to have. are present. Where you want highlights, you want to make sure that it's light enough. You know, as you're making your patterning. So this darker giraffe color is that orange into my black and brown space. Right? Making it darker. You can see it's a full gamut. Mm -hmm. This is a great time to practice all the different little browns that you make. I like to have some of the spots be bigger and some be smaller. Some are lighter, some are darker. And come up from the bottom. You can always come into the red, change the color as you go. And 
little darkness into it. Mm -hmm. And a little shading to some of the spots up here as well. You know how we're doing? I do. Now we're going to go down his little neck. His neck is definitely more in the orange space. Mm -hmm. Orange with brown. These are bigger and they're more um, kind of not geometrical, but they're just a bigger shape. I definitely make sure that they're they come in and they don't touch each other. This is the giraffe's version of you can't see me. <laughs> I think stuff can see it, but I can't wait to say that. I cannot see it. I can see. I'm doing a little short stroke. So the spots are here. That's where the spots are. So let's call this a step because that's a lot to kind of visually take in. Take a picture and then we'll do the other giraffe and then we'll make the spots look more giraffey. But already we're kind of getting into that giraffey, giraffey space. It's true, we are. I'm already getting there. So let's see here. The giraffes are a weird topic. Um, you can paint them very simply. You can paint them in a very complicated way. You can paint them very abstractly. You can focus on small elements of them and still know it's a giraffe, like a giraffe eye. And it's, what is it called? It's little horn? Are very unique looking. So you can, you can paint giraffes without even painting a whole giraffe and have people understand you're talking about a giraffe. It is a really kind of special creature in that way. Mm -hmm. When I come around here, I definitely want to show the small spots, and you know, we've got the bigger spots. Get into the brown and black. We change spot color. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's more red, sometimes it's more brown. In his little spot. He's got some. in a little spot. I think giraffe spots are kind of like fingerprints. Like they're not two giraffes alike or some. Uh, that could be like an internet myth that I've just turned into true facts in my head. Mm.
Mm, too dark. What happens? I just go get into a red and orange. I'll blend that out and it'll be okay. And those are regular shapes. They're just regular spots. And we can do that. We can absolutely do that. Making spots. Making patterns. Confusing lines. We can do that on our canvas. Mm-hmm. The lines in our imaginary world will never be able to see our draft. Pretty good. And when you've got that in, we can call that a step. All right. And we're pretty close. We're getting there. We're coming okay. to the resolution. So what? Fast? Oh, the spots were fast, yes. Spots were fast. Now, I'm going to take, and I just washed them today, I'm going to take a tool called a Princeton Filbert Grainer, and I'm going to come in and I'm going to make the spots have a little bit more dynamic kind of personality. So I'm going to come here and take this little grainer and go over the little spot. And it's going to make some little, kind of like little hair. I don't have to do this everywhere, but it's nice to do. See how I'm doing? Mm -hmm. I can get into any of my colors that I want to. I can use this to sort of shade and create drama in spots. And it's just a nice technique. I can do on some of them. Nice thing that you can look at and enjoy. Gilbert Grainer. You could use a little fan brush or a little detail brush. What we're just trying to do is kind of create a little sense of maybe hairs. Tough to do up in the little, um, these little guys up here, it's a little tougher to do. You have to be uh, pretty careful with your brush. You can do it, you just got to be pretty careful with your brush. Isn't that nice? I can also come in and take a little bit of my fluid white and my basic giraffe color. Kind of define some of the spaces in the lighter areas between the spots. See how I'm doing? Where I need it to be a little more on edge, I just take the greener to the side and make it kind of like a little filbert. But it does give me a bit of a hair effect where I'm wanting it. I'm 
those of you guys that have gone out and grabbed a grainer or a grass comb, it's a good investment. The trick to it, though, is the paint has to be fluid enough. Um, I convinced my mom to grab one, and that, you know, she found, like, her first challenge was getting it to make the hair, and it's about, yes, yeah, was like that, the fluidity of the paint, and I was like, yep, absolutely. So my brush and the paint is pretty fluid to get the little hairs to show. Mm. You can make one of these, and I want to do a video where I show you how to make your own, like with a brush at home. Because you can take little scissors and kind of clip up maybe a brush you're not as fond of. Now here's a fun kind of thing I'm going to do. I'm going to come here and sort of at the nose because they have this little wrinkly nose. Isn't that wild? Weird, mm -hmm. cool way to do that. And also take this to sort of pull back my little ossicones here in the ears, even here on the manes. Little mane for highlight. Yeah, we can highlight the little mane a bit. The light highlight in it kind of warns us out. Come in and get a little bit of the black and brown together. Mm -hmm. And really speak to that looking pretty wonderful. These little touches can make a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Man, they really do. Getting some personality worked out on there, getting some stuff. Now, I'm going to dry this, and I'm going to show you a really cool way of shading them where they're layering over each other, and you need to cast a shadow, but you didn't want to have to paint all that shadow detail. So dry, dry, dry it, and I'll okay. show you the trick. So, Valerie was saying that the spot pattern on each, of giraffes, on each giraffe is unique, although the different subspecies of giraffes are separated in part by the normal shape of their spots. So basically the size and shape may be different uh, in overall pattern from different subspecies, but each animal has a unique set of spotting. That's pretty cool. We'll take a picture. Spots on a giraffe. Spots on a giraffe. We've really thought about it deeply. <laughs> Did you need to think about spots on a giraffe super deeply? I don't know. If you did, we got there. Oh, you guys did. Deep, breathe out, in, breathe out. All right. So we have glazy medium, and we have a nice soft brush. And I'm going to take a little bit of my black and brown together, kind of mix a pretty good shadow color. I'll make sure my brush isn't wet, and I'm going to get it onto my glazing medium, and I'm going to come here. And glaze the shadow with this head. He's casting. You see that? Mm -hmm. Isn't that wild? Now I like using this. You can. Um, you know, just thin with water, but the glazy medium makes it very, very stable. That's, a lot, that's the difference, is that the glazy medium makes sure that it binds and it stays.
right here on the other side of me and I'm going to add a shadow. Add a shadow on the neck. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Very blended, right? If you had not seen this technique, it is a game changer. This works for mist. This works for any sort of translucent technique. A great way to get a shadow in. with my finger anywhere I want to kind of deepen the shading. Look at that. Is that not extraordinary? Mm -hmm. I can still come here and say, all right, well, there's some deeper shadow than even this. Wow. Okay, like right there. But that pulls the head away from the giraffe friend, doesn't it? And it keeps them from disappearing. Into its little buddy. Come here and add a little bits of shadow and detailing. Glazing is just a hoot. Mm -hmm. Just a hoot. It's just a joy and it makes me super happy. I like it, like it very, very much. I might grab my greener and also get a little bit of my lighter color. Come here and add a little bit of that like little fur texture. Lighter. Just sort of breaking up those lines, right? That's how we do get those lines. The little nope. finishing touches. How do you know how much glazing medium to use to paint? Like put out? Like when you're like when you're mixing, like when you're picking up glazing medium and, and using I start it. with less is more. So less pigment to glazing medium if I'm trying to do like a transparent glaze like this. Hmm. If I'm trying to improve blendability, I, I I put in less medium to paint. So more more paint, less medium when I'm just trying to do slow my paint drying down to, you don't have to worry like with slow drying agents, a lot of times you have to only do 30% because they'll stop the ability of your paint to dry. But with glazing medium, you can do a tint, a tone, a kiss, a blush. Ah. You have no, you so much under much less stress to do it correctly. With some stuff, man, if you don't get it exactly right, it just will absolutely cause you so much trouble. I'm just adding little bits of this texture. Just creating little moments where maybe perhaps our giraffes are. Mm -hmm. Being giraffey. They're being so giraffey. And it doesn't hurt us to take this little moment, right? These little, these little spaces do not hurt us to take the time to do. Less is more sometimes. You can always, 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 you know, Add more. It's a little tougher to take away in art. Just is. Just the nature of it. So when you're working little elements or details out, you just want to think about, like, you know. Right.
where do I want those pop? You just look at what you've got and what you need. It can also improve the flow. Here. I'm just making sure we got good contrast on those things. Good oh, lighting. Yeah. Look at those go. I feel pretty happy with this. Yeah? I think we have come to a good place. You could continue on or you could stop here. That's really up to you. But I think I'm going to sign with a very galactic color here. You could be giraffe all day. You could be giraffe all day. Mm, still needs to be lighter. So that's always the thing for me is like finding it where you can read it. But it isn't going to change the composition. There we go. Look at that. That is nice. Right. We have a giraffe, a pair of giraffes. Cuddly giraffes. Cuddly giraffe. How'd you guys like that? I love this. This is great. Oh, we have so many gorgeous fall paintings coming up. There's so much to do. Um, got a lot of fun stuff coming up over the weekend on both the watercolor and the acrylic channel. The retreat next weekend. Uh, they're asking about that too. Yes. So next weekend we are having an art retreat. There, I think there is a spot. Is there a spot left? One. Okay. It came There's a back spot open. left. Um, if you want to just run out and come, and it's two days of. Just solid, solid painting, and you eat and you eat with me constantly, and you see me constantly, and you're going to be ready to get on the plane. Mm. At the end of that, from one to three on Sunday at the Pocono, uh, the Sha the Shawnee, the Shawnee Inn, the Shawnee Inn in, in the Poconos, um, yeah. from one to three, we're going to have a free meetup, and you're welcome to come and come meet us and get a picture taken, maybe come paint an ATC, um, just whatever, and that's open to everybody. You don't have to. I take it though there is an event it's great if you like say yeah i'm coming just so we have some idea because we'll try to have some like snacks and water and stuff there for everybody yeah i mean there may be more of you than we play it for but we're gonna give it a go <laughs> we're gonna do what we can we're gonna do what we can if you're on tiktok please go follow me as soon as i hit a thousand i will do some live streams from over there and that could be really fun um check out the watercolor channel follow instagram you're on Facebook, hit the page. We are live all the time, so you don't want to miss a class. So make sure you're following us on your favorite platform to watch your videos from. Wherever that is, hit that follow, get the reminders. That way you know when we're live. And I'm going to see you tomorrow on the Watercolor channel and, uh, and on Facebook for a hummingbird. It's going to be really pretty. Be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and I want to see you and an easel really soon. Bye-bye.